Hey guys, welcome back, it's Biggs. Now if you followed on part one where we talked about Scotty the amazing dinosaur here at the Royal Saskatchewan Museum, this is gonna be part two. No dinosaurs. Today we're gonna go into the life sciences uh, exhibit or galleries and it goes from north to south and explores all the different types of habitats that can be found within this province and all the fauna, flora and fauna that you can find. Let's take a peek. <laughs> One of those incredibly impressive dioramas with this, the moose. Now the moose that you find here is kind of, the, I don't know if it's a subspecies, but it's, we call it the prairie moose. It's a little bit shorter in stature because it doesn't need the longer legs to even have it in the marshes like some of the other ones. This one has a slightly shorter legs. It's still a fairly large and formidable animal. For all the bird people. They also do another super, super cool type of uh, dioramas and stuff. Look at the scale on this one here. Bog insects, but look at the size of the water beetle. Like, this is incredible. You know, Drosera type sundews. There are native sundews to Saskatchewan. There are native pitcher plants to Saskatchewan. You see the different dragonflies and stuff. So this is the type of things that you would find in a peat bog. And speaking of peat bogs, bogs, fins, and muskegs. This is basically what it is. This is live sphagnum moss. Obviously, this is a model of live sphagnum moss. Different types of plants, bladderworts and stuff like that. Different types of carnivorous plants. Pingularias, droceras, different types of things. Different types of mammals and stuff that would inhabit these areas. And then you can see what these things look like below, as these are just ancient decaying bogs of peat moss, like hence the name peat bogs. And how they form. It's, it's a product that most people seem to think is like fully sustainable, but the rate that we are depleting these peat bogs for garden beds and different type of things is using that as an amendment for our soils and stuff is not at a rate that these, some of those peats are hundreds of thousands of years old. So, another impressive dioramas. That seems to be what most of the theme of this, this whole floor is. Talks about the renewals, what happens in a forest with the fires. There's an invasive plant, purple loosestrife, which is one of the first ones to come up. It's very well established in the prairies now. This is awesome. So this is the boreal shield. This is similar to the type of habitat where our, uh, just uh, east of me and obviously northern Saskatchewan as well, but during winter, there's a, a bear den where a bear would be hibernating with their cubs. A lynx on the, on the hunt. And some large ravens. They're not little birds. Ravens are large, large birds. That bird's Bigger than a macaw, bigger than any cockatoo. They're huge. Picking the bones of a carcass. Wolf family. And the caribou. One of the ungulates that lives up in the northern, mostly on like the areas like the tundra. These guys can eat mosses and lichens and things that you would think have zero, almost zero nutrition, but they can sustain on that. Absolutely cool. That's all solid resin, so it basically it looks like, like water and the, the beaver is fully, fully encased. You can see it from above. As an aquarist, you even have duckweed. Lucky them. Another bird. Great blue heron. Another bird. Two more birds. But it gives you the indication the construction of a beaver dam. The entrance is underwater. More 
birds. Birds eating a fish. I like him even less now. Absolutely awesome. There's an otter. Real, real cool. Now we have these other impressive di dioramas with a squirrel evading a, I think it's an ermine. It's like a weasel type animal. Bird, woodpecker. But the, the main one is the huntress in this one is the mountain lion. And where I live on the prairies, it's not, no, people would generally not think that there is mountain lion there. They're definitely a formidable predator. But uh, the year that we moved into our property, uh, we found very, very large paw prints in the soft mud of our ditch. We know there's bears, we know there's wolves, we know there's coyotes, but the paw print of a mountain lion is very distinct. That's a super neat display of some of the different fish. We've got some walleye, a burbot there on the bottom left, some lake whitefish, we've got perch, but it's the monster up there in the back. The wolf, kind of hard to see, but there's a giant northern pike right there. And then there's a bird trying to eat my fish. Birds. I love how they even made that little touch of the bubbles, like when a bird would dive down and, and exhale, there'd be all the bubbles. I think that's really cool. And continuing on, this is, <laughs> sadly, without the hills, this is more reminiscent of what it looks like at my place. <laughs> you know, scrub, birds, skunks and squirrels. Sure there's a lot of birds, porcupines and white-tailed deer. Gives you a real indication of all the types of uh, animals that inhibit, inhabit the areas around me. Next, we come into the open grasslands. Much as I'm not a big fan of birds, this is a pretty impressive, really neat looking diorama. That's pretty cool, not gonna lie. And at the roots of the grass gives you an idea of what it looks like. Any organic matter that lands on the prairie soil, pile of dung, bonanzas, all that stuff that lizard. This is where the isopods and things like that, thing, other things that we're interested in keeping. So, you know, things like different types of spiders, like wolf spiders and stuff like that. We've got different types of insects and beetles, and we've got different types of fungus, things like that. Isopods, centipedes, all these things that live in that soil strata. There's an ant. And just for scope and scale, gives you an idea of there's a grasshopper. My wife's absolute favorite. I absolutely love these things. That's super cool. And then the pronghorn antelope. I've seen those just in my drives uh, working here in this area. And then the shorebirds. Birds. Another little diorama. We've got some tadpoles. We've got a water beetle. Some snails. That's a dragonfly larvae. That's a snails again. Love those. More of the open grassland prairies. We've got some sort of Falcon has taken its prey down. And all these animals live in a fairly inhospitable type area. So you notice how they're, most of them are fairly well camouflaged, like the burrowing owls, or is this some sort of a, I think it's a sage grouse. Oh, now we finally get to something really, really cool. Snake City. Now, just a little bit, about four hours, maybe five hours, west of here is an area known as Leader, Saskatchewan. And in that area, it's almost like the Badlands. That area is very, very distinct for its habitat. And that habitat runs in a wave that goes all the way down from that southern Saskatchewan 
uh, eastern Alberta and runs in a wave all the way down through the states all the way down to Mexico. Now what it is unique about is this is this very habitat is one of the habitats of the only one of only two rattlesnake species that actually live in Canada. And this is the prairie rattlesnake. This is Crotalus viridis. And I've been trying to get out to a leader to be able to do and see them in the springtime, and it just hasn't worked out with my schedule every single time, be it weather or something else comes up, work conflict. But it just one day we'll get out there and we'll do the counts. We'll see some beautiful animals again, animals that command a lot of respect. That is a full-on rattlesnake that packs a definite wallop of a punch if you should get bit. So treat the animal with respect, give it its distance. But in that area, we also have bull snakes, and then we've got the two types of garter snakes. There's one there. But what happens, because they live in this type of climate, is what happens is these animals go down deep into these holes in the earth. And they go, it's called a hibernaculum. And they go way down there and they hibernate for the winter. And then they emerge in the spring. And then they return in the fall. Yeah, there it is right there. When spring arrived, most of the snakes in the hibernaculum head off to search for prey. You can travel up to 12 kilometers away and search for their food. Very, very cool. And they have this little tunnel to give you any idea of what it would actually look like right inside the heart of the hibernaculum. Well, that alone made my day. Why these hibernaculums are so and absolutely critical to survival. Snakes can't dig. Well, not these guys. They don't have any ability to dig. So they're resilient. They are re reliant on another animal to create a home that they can then eventually take over once it's abandoned. Or in the case of some of these animals like the, the, the garter snakes in, say, Manitoba and Narcissus, they go into these areas where there's little fissures between the different uh, limestone and stuff. And they have to go very, very far deep into the ground because when these areas where we reside in the wintertime, it drops down enough that we get the frost line will go down often sometimes six feet into the soil. The animals to survive, they're going to have to be below that. So some of these hibernaculums are 15, 10, 15 feet underground. Just more and more of these beautiful dioramas. The elk. There's definitely no shortage of birds here. Really cool, they have like a little learning lab where on you know certain days they can have educational projects going on with the kids. Monarchs, an animal that is critically, critically threatened. These, they, they migrate in absolute mass all the way down to Mexico. Hard to imagine that something weighs nothing. These are not, uh, these are not passed on butterflies. I believe these are all artificial. But uh, to make this incredible display, <laughs> I'm sure it took absolutely many, many hours to make. But to take that animal and think it migrates all the way down to Mexico for part of its survival, to me, is just almost unheard of. And now, this is not something to do. This is more talking about earth sciences, but understanding the importance of tropical rainforests. You can see where, they can, where the conditions are right. Now, as we talked when we were looking at the dinosaur area and stuff like that, Saskatchewan is basically up here. And that used to be where the equator is, but the equator now is in here. So all those tropical regions go right across in a kind of a set way. This is a really, really neat. This is a Costa Rican re replica of a Costa Rican rainforest. Costa Rica is way down here. Saskatchewan, Costa Rica. <laughs> but... Costa Rica is known as a, as a country that is very, very pro-conservation of its flora and fauna. They have an incredible bounty of bird species, frog species, all sorts of stuff. So when you see the trees set up with all these different models of ferns and bromeliads and orchids and stuff, that is pretty much what it would be like different types of aeroids and stuff, just overtaking the trees. Oh, we've got a 
locate some of the animals in here. I'm pretty sure there's, these are all birds, birds, birds. It's mostly birds. Oh, there we go. There we go, little snake right there. But otherwise, there's birds everywhere. Very cool. Now, you wouldn't think coming from the Costa Rican rainforest that the next logical place we'll go is the Arctic. That's where we're going. We're going to the Arctic where we got things like snow fox or Arctic fox and polar bear and musk ox. To live in these environments, it takes, you got to be a different kind of animal to live there. In summer, it might look nice. But you know, it's, it's just filled with different types of grasses and lichens and mosses and stuff. It's a pretty harsh environment. And these animals have to take in the bulk of their nutrition during those lean months, to, or sorry, during those bountiful months to be able to carry them through when it starts getting bad. Nice message about conservation. Everywhere you go, even in an area like Saskatchewan, Canada, there are animals that are greatly threatened with extinction. So we look here and we talked earlier about the monarch butterfly. There's other species of mosses and stuff. Other moths, lake sturgeon, eastern belly racer. These are all animals that are critically threatened or borderline extinct. These habitats that we, that these animals inhabit are fragile and they need some protection. The bison were almost extirpated many, many years ago, but they were finally on the, on the verge of comeback. And there's areas, uh, Yellowstone National Park in the US, Riding Mountain National Park in Canada, but there's these few areas that have set up these areas or preserves where they're trying to establish na naturalized colonies and bringing these animals back from the brink of extinction. Well, hope you guys enjoyed that little tour into this incredible gallery. The fact that the Royal Saskatchewan Museum is basically free, it's like a $5 donation to come, and take, to, to come here and explore these amazing galleries. This alone to me was worth it. <laughs> but I really, I enjoyed it myself. I had a great time not only showing you guys, but actually you know, taking a, some time to appreciate the habitats around me, the animals that are around me, the environments. And, and making that conscious effort to make sure that I can do better. I can do better. Now, it's up to you to do make those choices for yourself. But if you ever find yourself in the middle of Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada, definitely make a stop at the Royal Saskatchewan Museum. Take care, guys. Cheers. Ah.